But I think that's it for announcements. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to beg your mercy tonight uh, as I was explaining, or better word, complaining to Dr. Allen over there earlier. Uh, boy, not being able to type with my right hand really puts me off my game, yeah. And putting this Bible study together yesterday and today was tedious with a capital T. And my notes look way different than they normally look because I've been hitting the dictation button and talking. And then, did you know that dictation program swears? <laughs> I actually wrote a sentence. What did I write? I meant to say, what did I say? In other words, and it came out with an F-bomb. When I went back to read it, I'm like, excuse me, what? <laughs> anyway, so everything looks different on the paper than it normally looks. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. But anyways, let's just jump in and let's just get into the book of Hebrews. Chapter 11, uh, which is a sermon or a teaching written to first century Jews who had some exposure to the gospel in the church, but were tempted to flee back to the, familiar, the familiarity of the synagogue, the temple, the law, and the ceremonies. And the author of Hebrews is showing them how Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, prophesied about in the Old Testament, greater than everything in the Old Testament, who brings a greater covenant, a greater testament. And this is, a, this is combined with warnings that you cannot go back to the synagogue, the temple, the law, and the ceremonies, and there will be no other way or no other covenant after Jesus. This is it, and he's compelling them, don't miss it. The author recognizes their struggles with the oppression that they're under, and then he brilliantly shows them that not only is the New Testament activated by faith, not law, but then he lists a whole bunch of Old Testament characters who survived their challenges by faith, and that ultimately it was their faith that justified them. And he's urging the, um, the Jews, these first century Jews, to exhibit that kind of faith. So, so far, uh, in chapter 11, which is the Hall of Faith chapter, we have covered Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Sarah. Um, I love this line. All these, pe all these people were still living by faith when they died without receiving what had been promised because they were looking for a country of their own. This world is not our home. We're only passing through. They were looking forward to the promises. Okay. So last week we start, or two weeks ago, I guess I should say, we started out with Isaac and Jacob. Um, there was three promises that they never realized, nor did Abraham or Joseph for that matter. They never possessed Canaan. Um, they didn't create a great nation. And they didn't bless all the world, at least not while they were alive, through their descendants. Um, yet all four of these guys consistently passed on the promise um, to, their, <laughs> to their heirs, which the it translated errors, get it, E-R-R, -R. I'm like, to their errors, <laughs> that's a different way to refer to your children, <laughs> their errors, yeah, um, because the promise was always about an inheritance to come, and then we also talked about Moses two weeks ago, and the story of Moses, of course, begins with the faith of his parents, who along with the Hebrew midwives, um, feared God, not Pharaoh. And then we see Moses himself who values his heavenly citizenship as more important than the luxuries provided to him by the Pharaoh's kingdom. In fact, um, the book of Hebrews talks about how much greater is the treasure of knowing God and Christ than any earthly treasure. And lastly, even the Israelites themselves as a people get a shout out in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 because it says, by faith, they passed through the Red Sea. And they really were. We talked about that um, two weeks ago. They really did exhibit faith to jump down into that pit where the waves piled up on each side and trust that God would get them through. We tend to not give them perhaps enough credit for how radical it was for what they were doing because even though they were fleeing um, slavery, they were also fleeing security, you know? And it's a really interesting picture of sin because, you know, depending on your all's testimony, uh, what you left behind, even as hideous as it was, there have perhaps been times you wish you could go back to it or thought, maybe I'll, I'll forget this Christian stuff's too difficult. I think I just want to go back to the way I was, you know. But that's going back to Egypt. There's no going back. And that's exactly perfectly in line with what the author of Hebrews is telling to these well, some seem to be converted Jews. Some seem to be not converted Jews that he's writing to 
There's no going back to the Old Testament. There's no going back to the synagogue, the temple, and the Old Testament way of sacrifices. Um, we're, we're headed forward with Jesus, and that's kind of how we wrapped up um, two weeks ago. So tonight we're going to continue with the Old Testament saints. And where do we kick off? Uh, we start in verse, actually, uh, 30. Uh, we're going to the people. So um, this is after they passed through the Red Sea is on dry land. Uh, and after the Egyptians did so, they were drowned. And then verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. So verse 30 is about Joshua guys and the wall of Jericho. I think most of you all know that story pretty much. They're entering, you know, Moses has died. They're, they enter, you know. By the way, this is one of those little factoids that people forget all the time. But, you know, there was two splitting of the waters, right? There was the Red Sea, but um, Joshua splits the Jordan River. And the Jordan River actually piles up, and I think it flooded out up above, up above wherever they were. They actually, they crossed the Jordan River on dry land. Isn't that interesting? They didn't get their feet wet going into the wilderness or going out of the wilderness, yeah? And... Um, then they head into, and remember the object, the plot line, they are going in to take the promised land that God had promised them, the land of the Canaanites that their ancestors had been too chicken to do, so God waited till they all died. Maybe chicken's not the right word. They didn't have enough faith is a better way to put that. Disobedient, yeah, disobedient is actually a more biblical word. And they didn't have faith that God would do as he said. In fact, that's a lot about what we're going to talk about, even just in this one, um, my, again, reading my notes, it's going to go on all night. It says, what kind of face did they have? <laughs> I'm like, why does it say face? What kind of faith did they have? Um, well, they believed in the promise because in Joshua chapter 2, um, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have, del I have past tense, delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. But that's four chapters before they actually surround Jericho. But you see the verbiage there. God tells Joshua, I've already done it. So God gives them this promise before they actually attack the city. By the way, he also promised um, in the book of Deuteronomy that he would hand over kings to them. That's while they were out in the desert. I will hand kings over to you and um right before they give the final shout because you know they march around you know they march around or whatever right before the final shout that's going to drop the walls of jericho joshua yells out look he has he has he has delivered jericho to us and then they shout and then blow the trumpets and the walls um come down by the way one little small tidbit about that um I've heard it said, and I don't know if this is true, but I read somewhere once that when archaeologists went to, um, to uh, what, what do they call that? Excavate, Excavate thank you, the uh, Jericho. They found collapsed walls, but what was different is that it appeared as if the walls had collapsed and then been set on fire, which is different because normally you set the walls on fire and the heat causes them to collapse and then you go in. But apparently, I don't know how true that is. I don't know if that's like, yes, Briar. They did find that, and they said it was supernatural heat. Supernatural it was, heat, it yeah, was oh, unreal, yeah. The unreal. they found was just incredible heat was there. It's too bad we can't go there. Uh, if you've ever been to Israel, they don't let you into Jericho. It's a pit. Yeah, it's, it's very dangerous. Yeah, anyways, it's a Palestinian-controlled area, and it's not safe. Anyways. Um, but uh, John MacArthur said something like this. It had been 40 years since that kind of faith had been exhibited. Yeah, 40 years going back to uh, the original guys that came out of Israel. Um, I also love this little small tidbit. These are one of those things when you got to wonder if when they got their, um, no pun intended, when they got their marching orders, right? You know, so we're going to walk in a circle. <laughs> And that's how we're going to defeat these guys in Jericho. We're going to walk in a circle. And God's like, yes. Without saying a word. 
Yeah, we're going to have you walk in a circle without saying, without a, word. saying a word, right? Yeah. And then when on the, at the moment, we're going to shout, and then those walls are going to fall down. Okay, God, yeah. Um, so um, I thought that's, that's a lot of faith. Uh, I read this story today. Uh, it goes from a, where's Garrett? From a daily bread I read a long time ago, and I went and I found it. It's the story of Robert and Mary Muff Moffat. It spelled it wrong again, but anyways, yeah. Uh, they were missionaries to South Africa in the 1800s and were living in uh, the little country of Botswana for 10 years. After 10 years, they didn't have one convert, <laughs> right? And um, their friends back in England, they were English missionaries, were telling them, give it up. And they were saying, no, we feel called by God to Botswana. And we really feel like these people need Jesus. And this is where we need to be. And so they were threatening to cut off their support and everything. And finally, a friend who felt sorry for them in England wrote to them and said, listen, is there anything we can do to bless you? You must be greatly discouraged. And Robert Moffat wrote back, um, he said, yes. We want you to send us a, a communion set that would be good for, say, 30-odd people, a set of communion cups and whatever, this and that, without one convert, right? And right after he sent off the letter, they got their first six converts or whatever and began taking them through the um, catechism or whatever the Protestant version of catechism is uh, or whatever, and they had a big ceremony planned for um, their new convert's first conversion, only the communion set was delayed um, in the mail, but it came the day before their first communion uh, with these new converts. And that's not actually the great punchline of the story is, the great punchline of the story is Robert and Mary Moffat became the most successful and famous missionaries throughout all of South Africa, Botswana, South Africa, um, over into Zimbabwe with the indigenous people and um, uh, became very famous, had 10 kids and one of their daughters, the other, the Mary the Younger, married David Livingston. But they were faithful, yeah? And they were so faithful, they were like, yeah, God said he's gonna do this, send us, we're, but we're gonna need communion sets after 10 years of not having one convert, yeah? So I thought that was a good picture of faithfulness. Okay, any questions or comments about um, Joshua guys in Jericho? No? Okay, uh, let's move on to Rahab, um, verse 31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. There's that word, disobedience, yeah? Now, she's an unusual choice for the Hall of Faith. Um, being both a prostitute, a Gentile, and a Canaanite. In fact, she was an Amorite, a race of people that God long before, back in Genesis, said he had marked them out for destruction. So, you know, not remotely Jewish, she's an Amorite. Um, but I want to read um, this little section of Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 through 11 to you. <clears throat> um, before the spies laid down for the night, this is... They, this is um, uh, Joshua guys send spies in to spy out um, the land. Um, she went up on the roof and said to them this. This is really cool and very instructive because remember, the Israelites haven't done any conquering yet in Canaan. She says, I know that Yahweh has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on all of us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord, Yahweh, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. So how is that? So this wasn't like, who are these guys outside our gate? People were inside the city of Jericho going, oh no, 
These are the people of Yahweh. And everything Yahweh has done, we've heard about what's going on. And so um, in addition to that, um, there's this idea that those who were living um, in Jericho, oh, and the Amorites, I'm like, why does it say and the Emirates? <laughs> Amorites, this is going to happen all night, you understand, right? The Emirates, I'm like, oh, the Amorites um, were known, by the way, for their great debauchery, their great cruelty, and their great sinfulness. Whereas the Israelites were known throughout the region for a ridiculously high standard of righteousness, love, and fairness. What I'm speculating on right now is I wonder if Rahab was aware of this, if they were aware of this. And the reason I thought of that today when I was watching, uh, when I was reading this was because last night I watched a movie uh, on the recommendation of Rick uh, you might have even seen it, some of you, because it's like the number five movie right now on Netflix. It's a World War II movie called The Forgotten War. The Forgotten, the Forgotten Battle. Is that what it is? The Forgotten Battle. Yeah. And um, without giving too much of a plot spoiler, because there's a lot going on in the movie, one thread of the story um, follows a young Dutch boy who, after... Um, um, that Holland and the Netherlands has fallen to the Nazis, he kind of um, gets swept up in the idealism of the uh, of fascism of the, of the Nazi way and uh, joins the Nazi army. But he's become very, very, very disillusioned. And at a certain point in the movie, he realizes, I'm on the wrong side. Like, like he has an inner moral compass that realizes this isn't right. I can't live like this. And so, uh, well, in case you want to watch the movie, I'll spare you what happens in the end of the movie. Um, but he answers his conscience. And I'm just sort of curious if perhaps Rahab is aware of this, you know, living in this deeply fallen, um, um, pretty gnarly uh, and cruel um, society if there wasn't an appeal to have these people come who were known for a high level of righteousness. And I think, and I would hope all of us in this room are fairly aware of how high that standard was if you stuck around and went through the book of Leviticus with us, right? It was a pretty strict law that guaranteed fair treatment for everybody, including servants and slaves. We're we're guaranteed to be treated justly. Anyways, that was just my little speculation. However, um, because of this, and then I'll stop for a second. Uh, we all know the story. Rahab and her whole family is saved. They actually become Jews. Uh, I, didn't re I didn't know this until today, but some people have speculated. In fact, Jewish tradition holds that um, she married Joshua. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know. Right. Um, but as you're probably most of you are aware, but if you're not, you might be really interested to know that she is listed in the lineage of Jesus. How radical is that? I forget which of the Gospels. Maybe it's both Matthew and is it? Ma I'm sure it's in Matthew. Um, but she's right there. This Amorite woman is listed as a direct ancestor of Jesus. Or could I say Jesus is a directly in the line of descendants of, um, of Rahab, which is huge, as you're probably aware. Um, MacArthur made a good point about it. I didn't write down his quote, but he writes down that throughout the entire narrative story of the Bible, um, grace is indeed available to all. Yeah, Even as much as he tells the Jews to be a, an apart people, all through the Bible we see people um, deciding to follow Yahweh. And in the case of Rahab, for example, obviously is brought completely into the fold and considered Jewish. Yeah? So now we're going to move into um, what I wrote as honorable mentions, you know. And I need to kind of caveat this and pause for a little bit of an explanation. Um, because not everybody likes it when we kind of human, what I call humanize Bible characters. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, what I'm going to do on our first pass through these guys is I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share with you a lot of their faults and their warts and their bumps and their like where they, and the reason I do this is because 
you know, if we think of the great hall of faith guys, we tend to think of the uber perfect church people, right? You know, super faithful all the time. But it's hilarious when you go back and read some of these guys' stories um, and find out they're real humans, yeah? Like, let me give you an example from secular history. One time uh, when I was stuck in South Africa uh, during a long flat lull with no waves, and I'm a reader, and I'd gone into the uh, Jeffreys Bay Public Library. It was pretty funny because at first the woman wouldn't loan me a book. Like, she wouldn't give me one book. And I like, could I leave a deposit? And I begged her, I'll leave you my passport. She, this, you know, young California surf guy with long hair. Boy, she didn't want to part with one book. So she gives me a book. And I come back the next day. Can I get, you know, to, to exchange? And she looks at me like, you read that? And I'm like, yes. She's all, why don't you take three? <laughs> I go, okay. And you know, by the end of the winter, we're, all, we're, you know, we're on first names basis and I'm walking out with 10 books and whatever. Yeah, because she figured me for a reader. But one of the books I read was really interesting, fascinating book. I've never seen it again. It was um, the, the true, uh, the true um, written accounts, journal, journal accounts of uh, Sir Francis Drake. And it was, what they did was a masterpiece. They took the official account from the expedition and combined it with a personal journal of the priest who was on board, combined with a journal of a random sailor that they found from the expedition and weaved the three journals together into a narrative story. But what was fascinating to me is right now, as I tell you, Sir Francis Drake, who circumnavigated the globe back in 16 whatever, do you picture these guys that are like, we can do this, men, follow me, men, and we'll go around the world. Okay, how they ever survived it was an act of God. What a bunch of buffoons. <laughs> they squabbled and fought amongst themselves over petty little fights. You know, they'd start with three ships, but this Monsignor refused to be on the same boat as this guard over here. And he had trouble. One night, they, uh, they, uh, one time they, they captured a ship full of wine and they got drunk and they burned two of their ships down to the gunwales <laughs> through the big party. So they actually had to pile like 150 guys onto two little itty bitty boats until they could go capture another one. I mean, you're like, you're reading this, you're like, this is not what I expected at all, right? Well, let's read verse 32. <clears throat> And what more shall I say? I don't have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, Jeff, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. And let's just stop right there and let's unpack these one by one. Gideon, for example, it always drives me nuts. And you've probably heard people say this. Maybe you've said it yourself. I hope to not insult you. When someone says, well, I'm just not sure what God wants me to do. So I'm going to lay out a fleece with this idea that what that means is I'm going to do something so God will explain to me which way to go. Well, I hope you know that's not what the fleece was for. God had already told Gideon what he wanted him to do. The reason Gideon puts out a fleece is because he doesn't really want to do it. <laughs> and he's hoping God will let him weasel out of it, right? But before we even get to that part, you just got, I just want to read you the very first part of the story. This is even before the whole you know, command of where you're going to go. To, I think he was going to go for the, uh, the Midianites is who was, he was going to go attack, right? But even before that, look, look at this part. This is from Judges chapter 6, just verses 12 and 13. When the angel of the Lord, imagine this, appeared to Gideon, he said, I love this, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Right? Kind of buttering him up a little bit, right? <clears throat> uh, pardon me, my lord, Gideon replied. Uh, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Huh? Where's all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord's abandoned us and given us over to the hands of the Midians. That's how he answered the angel of the Lord with a complaint and a gripe. And an accusation that where have you been? And how come you're not doing all that cool stuff you did back in the desert, right? And so, of course, you know, God's like, all right, you want to see something in action? Then I'm going to have you go down and you're going to attack the Midianites. And then Barak's like, I mean, um, Gideon's like, uh, are you sure? <laughs> 
So he does the first fleece, you know, if there's, what is it, dew out, no, at first if there's dew on the fleece and it's dry everywhere else, then I'll know you want me to do this. So that's exactly what happens. In fact, he squeezes the fleece and it drains out. And Gideon's like, mm, that didn't work. So he goes, I'll tell you what, I'm going to put the fleece out again and if you really, really, really want me to do it, this time all the ground around will be wet and the fleece will be dried. So God does it. So he's like, darn it. Now, before I hack on him too much, um, he was doubtful, he was hesitant and fearful, but he did it. And not only did he do it, but he was so convinced eventually that God, eventually, I put that in there, that God would do it. Uh, he started to take a whole army and God's like, no, 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 no. You won't be needing all those people. Yeah. And, and God, he's like, and he keeps reducing and reducing and reducing and reducing and Gideon does it, so good on for Gideon. But anyways, he didn't start out that way. This is from Judges chapter 4. She, Deborah, sent for Barak, son of Albinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord God, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. And I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. And Barak said to her, well, if you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. And you know what Deborah says? Okay, fine. I'll go. But because of this, you will receive no glory and no honor because of it, because a woman went with you. And Barak says, okay. <laughs> but he goes and he does it, right? Um, and, the, and uh, the honor goes to the woman. Okay. And then Samson, I think most of you pretty much know the story of Samson. It's not usually the part they teach in Sunday school. But he has been described by various commentators as being gullible, immature, and self-centered. And he certainly had a weakness for foreign women, right? In spite of all the good warnings that he got. He's sort of famous for squandering the great gift of strength that God gave him. Although he was uh, victorious in many different battles. However, again, at the very end of his life, he calls out to God and he says, God, by the way, at this point, he's had his eyes gouged out and he's in chains. And he says, God, strengthen me one more time. And with his last strength, he pulls the roof down and kills a whole bunch of Philistines um, and glorifies God as being more powerful than the idols of the Philistines. But Samson's, a lot of his life, he's not exactly the uh, picture of faith. Then next up we have Jephthah, who, by the way, was a super faithful guy who uh, went out by the command of God and defeated the Amorites. Unfortunately, he makes a really stupid, foolish vow to, quote, sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my tent when I get home, which ends up being his precious daughter. Now, some have speculated that the correct interpretation of the Hebrew means that he didn't actually sacrifice his daughter, um, but that it meant he, she would have to remain a virgin for the rest of her life. However, that is clearly not the way it's translated into English, because when you read the English version, it says he wept and then sacrificed his daughter, kind of made a very rash and foolish vow, okay? And then uh, we also have David. Uh, I probably don't need to explain much here. Um, he obviously was a super faithful guy, the greatest king of Israel by a long shot, um, who unfortunately also had a weakness for women. And also, unfortunately, he didn't seem to pass on his righteousness as well as perhaps he could have to um, Solomon. But what I find most interesting about this is that in the Hall of Faith, um, David only gets his name mentioned. Don't you find that interesting? Like, you'd think Abraham got about a full column, you know? Sarah and Abraham got a full column. Moses got like a page, you know, a full page. Um, Moses got a full half page. Man, you'd think David would have got more than just David, you know? I mean, I, I thought that was kind of really interesting, yeah? Uh, but he had his things. And then um, re regarding Samuel and the prophets, um, honestly, with Samuel, you'd kind of have to be quite a nitpick. You know, you'd have to kind of um, nitpick to find fault with Samuel. 
Um, however, you could at least say he definitely failed um, in raising his sons because he raised a couple loser sons who really were a disgrace uh, to him and a disgrace to all of Israel. He didn't manage to pass his righteousness on to his sons. However, um, to give uh, Samuel and actually all the, um, the prophets some really serious props out of this whole list of people, uh, Samuel and the prophets are the first who are not really warriors against the enemies of God, but perhaps um, what they're called to do could be considered more difficult. Uh, their severest opponents were not Philistines and Amorites and Ammonites, but their own people, yeah? And um, Samuel had to speak out against idolatry and immorality with his own people and with his own tribe. And I really resonate with that statement, which, by the way, was not an original idea whatsoever, but I read it because um, I'm guilty of that. It takes a lot of courage to go after your own people, yeah? And it's easier to stand on a street corner and, you know, or yell at people coming out of a bar, you're going to hell, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's easier to do that than it is to go to a close friend and say, hey, brother, I'm concerned about you. You're blowing it. And uh, you need to stop it. You know, does that make sense? Yeah? Like, the prophets had to go after their own people and were rejected by their own people, which is different than going into battle with 500 of your closest buddies for, uh, you know, for the Lord, which is to stand all by yourself and cry out against unrighteousness um, in your own people. Okay. Um, well, let's read verse... Uh, no, let's actually stop right there. Does anybody want to comment on any of those people? I'm so glad you said that, Donna. That's my, actually my, now my favorite application out of that story. Because... Um, what, didn't we just sing that song? Was it last Sunday or the Sunday before? But I am who you say I am. Did we sing that on Sunday? I am who you say I am. And then what is the other one? The uh, Good Good Father song. Uh, you are, what is it? You're the Good Good Father. Is who you are. And I am loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. And, and then like to go back to Gideon. And something that I think came up two weeks ago, the idea that the reason why God's promises are so sure is because he doesn't, he speaks reality into existence, right? Does that make sense? It's, it's different than me saying, um, you know, tomorrow I'm going to make Lewis uh, a roast beef sandwich, you know, and, I, and I've got really good intentions, but I might get the big save and they don't have any roast beef because it's big save, right? You know, that, that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but me telling Lewis, I'm going to make him a roast beef sandwich is an intention that I have. But God can quite literally say roast beef sandwich and hand you a roast beef sandwich because he can create reality. And so if God says tomorrow I'm going to make you a roast beef sandwich, it's as good as made. Already, it's as if it was already made in the future. Are we getting a little too that far? Has to be the weirdest, uh, the, is that the weirdest illustration you've ever heard? Well, you got to remember, I was on opiates all last week. I was, you know, I'm just now get coming down from the heroin. So, you know, I'm going to repeat that in case you didn't hear that in the back. We see ourselves when we look in the mirror. We see what we do in our service to the Lord. We tend to look all, all, all our faults. That's not how God sees us. He sees us through the veil of Christ. He sees us as we were created to be in perfection. God looks at you, looks at Gideon and says, you know, oh, mighty warrior, you know, and, and he's becoming that who God created him to be. OK, uh, well, let's read. Um, all these people went through these horrific things, and I'm just going to kind of read through them. I'm not really going to unpack a lot of this verse by verse, but verse 33, all these people who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. 
Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. And I love this last line. Line. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. He is, remember the audience who he's talking to. People that are becoming under oppression by Nero. And um, by the way, not heavy oppression yet. Like not yet to the point of shedding blood is what it says. But the oppression has begun. And he's pointing out their ancestors. This is what they went through by faith. And he's, in, he's saying that to encourage them, okay? And by the way, when you read all that, now you get to see all the amazing things that God can do with clearly less than perfect people, but people who are willing to go where God tells them to go. By the way, uh, just a small point, but structurally, structurally in the Hebrew, it comes out as three sets of three, the broad results of faith, personal deliverance and attaining gifts. Um, but I personally love most the weak, their weakness was turned to strength. I love that. Like that weakness turned. You will be who I say you are, right? Um, when, I, when I thought of that, I was trying to think of applications. When has your weakness been turned into strength? And, you know, I couldn't help but, of course, think about my own life. Where have I been weak that God turned into a strength? And um, uh, some of you I know that are actually in this room, uh, like I'll give you an example of Aaron Hoff. His great weakness uh, was, you know, drugs. And look, he's for how many years now he's been sober. And what is his ministry? What is his great strength in the kingdom? Is getting people off of drugs. Like God took his, you know, his worst thing and, and made him useful. My interesting thing, um, you might find almost comical is uh, my greatest weakness is wanting to be liked by everybody and always wanting to be encouraging no matter what. And because of that, for years in the ministry, I gave people really, really lousy advice. <laughs> I did. I mean, I, I don't, hopefully it wasn't that many people, right? But, you know, when people were struggling with sin, my advice would be like, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be fine. You know, da, da, da. What bad advice. The final turning point to me was I got together um, with a friend of mine who I was very close to him and his family. He was a, a horrible alcoholic. And uh, I very much cared for his wife and I cared for his children. They were very close to us. And we went out to lunch at Kaleho Cafe and I went off on him. <laughs> And I, like, practically yelling at the table was like, you're going to lose everything. And how are you going to feel when your kids are calling other du another dude dad? Because your wife is young and cute, and she is going to drop you like a hot potato. In fact, she'd already called the lawyer, and she's not going to be single for very long on this island. And some other dude will be living in your house, and your kids will start calling him dad because you're such a loser that you... We're only going to get visitation once a month, if. if that. And you know what? That guy's been sober, I just saw it was on Facebook, 12 years, 14 years now or something like that. And he comes to me and says, it's because that talk, bro. You scared the snow out of me, right? And I was like, oh, sometimes you have to risk not being liked. That's my greatest weakness. I want everybody to like me. But what I've discovered is that's a great way to send people off to hell, right? Or off to, you know, more sin, more sin or what have you. That sometimes the hard thing to say is knock it off to be a prophet. You know, that's what the prophets did. They stood in the courtyard and went, all of you are sinful. Knock it off. And we know when he talks about those who were um, faced jeers and flogging and chained in prison and stoned and sawed in two, <laughs> Who, who, who was doing all of that? Philistines or their fellow Israelites? I don't know about you, but when I read those verses, I think about the great prophets getting abused by their own people. You see? You see how, like, that can work? Okay. Yeah, how come Jeremiah's not in here? I know. He has book. Yeah, I got his own book. <laughs> yeah, there's... there's I'm 
surprised it doesn't end like one of those uh, books, you know, like in Chronicles or something where the author says, and there's much more than this, but that can be found in the other book or whatever, right? You know, are, are, are not all these deeds written in the book of Kings or something? Yeah, yeah. That's good, yeah. Yeah, anybody else? Talk, anybody else? I can't go over here. <laughs> no, no? All right. Well, we only just got a couple verses left, and then we'll start our wrap-up here. Verse 39. <clears throat> These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better. And I love this. Look how he brings us into it. God had planned something better for us. And I love this last line. I don't know that I ever really paid much attention to this line until this morning. God had planned something much better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect which clearly speaking of Christ. But let me, let me, let me, let's unpack this idea. So the, um, the, the New King James says, having gained approval through their faith, yeah, um, yet without receiving, as it says, it shows that their faith never got them immediate fulfillment, but it did get them the approval of God. But what I really love is this last line that connects us to the Old Testament saints that this author has just been talking about. Let me, um, I got to actually, it's such a long line of verse that I need. Okay, this is from 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 to 12. It's a lot of verses, um, but I'm going to enunciate more clearly those that I thought are really related to what we just read here. Um, but stick with me. So Peter says this, he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So you picture those Old Testament guys looking forward, even as we do, right? Who you, who through faith are shielded, shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be reveal, revealed in the last time. And all this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So look, we're getting lumped in now with the trials of the saints, right? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, isn't that interesting? Because those guys in the Old Testament, they were looking ahead to something they couldn't see. Even though you, you've, seen, you've not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end results of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then this is where he starts bringing in the Old Testament guys. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them, isn't that cool, was pointing when, sorry, one-handed, when, when he predicted the suffer, when they were predicting, predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. You ever think about that? It was revealed to them, the prophets of old. They were not serving themselves, but serving you, who will experience and receive the Messiah. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, um, even angels long to look into these things. And so let me summarize it like this. Their perfection, the Old Testament saints, would also be in Christ along with us. That's why I really love this line. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made Perfect. Their, their salvation is based on what Christ would do. Our salvation is based on what Christ has already done. They look forward, we look back. 
Both of us need faith, and our faith connects us with them through Christ. How's that? I've never really noticed that before in Hebrews, how he links us all together. Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. And so, um, I would wrap this up. I think we got about seven or eight minutes here. Um, I just wanted to ask you if any of you ever wanted to, or ever wanted, if any of you would like to share a story of a time ever in your life when perhaps you did something strictly by faith that maybe seemed somewhat silly at the time, but maybe bore fruit, or maybe you never saw fruit from it, you know? Like, you know, God says, I want you to conquer Jericho, and I want you to march around in a circle. I don't know. I Sometimes, did anybody ever drive junior high kids on zombie, <laughs> zombie scavenger hunt night and wonder, this is serving the Lord? Like, this is serving God? Or I sometimes think, have you ever given money to somebody to go do some missions thing and you never heard another word? Don't know like what they spent their money on or, you know, your, your story reminded me, uh, Garrett, you're the only one in here that remembers, uh, remember Mark Kuhn's plate glass? Yeah, I, I know, yeah. I know Greg, Greg yeah. and Carrie knows him. Yeah. He was like the most hilariously fired up Christian I'd ever seen in my life. He was, he was so on fire for God that everybody thought, oh, no, he's going to flame out and burn out. And he never did. He still is on fire. You've all probably heard me start, tell stories. He was the guy we'd be out surfing, and he'd be like, a set of waves would come in, and he'd be going, hallelujah, here comes the glory set. Praise Jesus. And people are like, who is this guy? You know, He was such a hoot. But we were, um, he worked room service at the West End pre-hurricane when I was a bellman there. And forgive me if I've told you all this story, but he was going off on a missions trip and it asked me if I would support his missions trip. And I said, yeah, I would. And I would, and I, had, I, had, I didn't know how I was going to do it until finally I knew it was coming down to, like, he was getting ready to leave, and I just felt compelled by God. I mean, it's just one of those things in my spirit. I felt like, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, dedicate this night's tips. Yeah, I, did I tell you this story? I think you told me one. Maybe one on one. So I, you know, so I get to I get to the West End about three p.m. and it's a group check-in day. It's gonna be. I knew it was gonna be a busy day. And Mark is getting ready for his uh, room service shift. He's like the next locker down or whatever. And I tell him, I go, Hey, Mark. So tonight I'm gonna dedicate whatever tips I get. I'm just gonna give you at the end of the night. He's all, man, he's super nice guy. He's like, ah, thanks, praise Jesus. Let's pray right now. You know, that's how we pray. <laughs> And I got to tell you, people, I'd been a bellman for, what, 15 years or something. I'd never had anything like it. I can't. It was like, yeah, people are throwing money at me. Like, like insanely, incredibly, like, you, like, imagine going to Vegas and every coin you put in, just ching, 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 ching. And I mean, it's just getting to the point where I'm like, this is insane. Did yeah. You give it to him? The whole thing. And I never, I, never even, I never even counted it. At the end of my shift, I handed him a wad like this big. And it, you know, normally when you're a bellman, it's all ones. No, no. It was fives, tens, and twenties. And people never would hit twenties back then. And I just went, I don't know how much this is, but there you go, brother. It was like just unreal, yeah? All right, awesome. Let's end it with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you. Uh, Lord, for the awesome uh, saints that we can look back um, to and see their faith. Thank you for the author of Hebrews for you know, documenting it, putting it together. And I thank you, God, even for that last word that we received, the last verse of chapter 11, that together with us, Lord, they look forward to you. We look back to you, God, and we are joined together in faith, one giant family together in your kingdom. And we're so grateful to be a part of it, God. Help us be a more faithful people well, it's our turn. It's our turn. They had their turn, and now it's our turn. And so it's our chance to be your faithful people and even be examples to those coming up behind us. We ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good fun.